Uh, thank you, Bushra. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'm thankful to IES for inviting me as a panelist in this meeting. This is honor for me. So for this uh, panel discussion, my topic is field, re field research to understand the challenging in PrEP retention and acceptance in Pakistan. So in the interest of time, uh, uh, Bushra, uh, what is time for each individual for this discussion? Four minutes. I think it's sufficient. Eh? So thank you. <laughs> so in the interest of, uh, interesting interest of the time, I would like to share some of the key findings of uh, programmatic operational research within the program, uh, which was carried out in two uh, major cities of Karachi and Larkana, which are historically linked with the major HIV outbreaks in Pakistan, especially in Sin. So the main idea was just to see that what are the challenges, barriers, and what are the issues for underutilization of PrEP services in MSM community in Pakistan. Because since rollout in 2022, we are facing underutilization of services all over uh, Pakistan in Sindh and Punjab as well. So the idea was to just explore the barriers. So I will be sharing the findings from this research, uh, field research. So uh, the research findings showed five broad categories uh, of the barriers. So from top to bottom, these included low awareness level, uh, low awareness level like uh, fear of side effects and taking medicines is very difficult. So this was the most frequently responded by the PrEP clients or the, uh, uh, the clients who could benefit from the PrEP. So did not, they did not accept uh, PrEP services from CBOs uh, due to these two major reasons. The next, next category was stigma and discrimination. So uh, it included not willingness of the PrEP clients to ART centers because they are not HIV negative. And usually the people who are HIV positive, they are supposed to go to HIV centers for treatment, care and support. But since they are not uh, HIV positive, say, so they refuse to take prep from uh, ART physicians, uh, ART centers. And they have also perceived social stigma and discrimination. The third one, uh, the leading category was low risk perception or the behavioral issues. The data shows that uh, there are uh, some of the, uh, the, the thinking of the key populations are misconceptions uh, which, uh, which hinder them uh, from utilizing PrEP services in sin. Like, I am healthy, why should I take uh, medicines? I am using condoms, so I am not at a risk of HIV. So these were the major concerns uh, reported by uh, PrEP clients who did not accept uh, PrEP services at CBOs. And the fourth category, uh, third ca fourth category was structural barriers, which included lack of time, lack of transportation, out of pocket expenses, and distance from ART center. And the last one category was clinical uh, barriers. So there were two, uh, uh, two uh, uh, in clinical barriers, there were two uh, responses using hormonal therapy and having di underlying disease like hypertension, kidney disease, uh, liver disease, or etc. So, three leading barriers to acceptance at CBO level were number one, fear of side effects, number two, was non willingness of the PrEP clients or the beneficiaries of PrEP to go to ART center and see physicians at ART centers, and third one was low risk perception. So these were the major reasons for not accepting or not starting PrEP by uh, uh, MSM community. Now coming to barriers for retention. For this purpose, we followed, initially followed, 50 PrEP clients who were on over daily PrEP, but they actually discontinued these services. They uh, uh, discontinued PrEP, uh, taking PrEP medicine. So we tried to follow them through outreach team who reached them just to explore that what was the reason for discontinuation of these services uh, for uh, PrEP uh, from ART. So again, again, the findings were the same. Uh, the leading cause was fear of side effects for taking pills without a disease, 
and followed by fear of stigma and discrimination at facility as well as society level and low risk perception. So if we see the barriers to acceptance and barriers to uh, discontinuation of the press services, they, these are almost same. So this was all from my side. Thank you very much. I think I have uh, completed my task discussion within time. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Sir, for being so time, <laughs> time bomb. We, Dr. Faisal Mufti. Thank, Thank you so much. So my topic was barriers and challenges, which is very similar to Rav Nawaz's. So, uh, so, I, I, so I don't have much more to say, actually, but just a couple of things. One is, you know, when we talk about barriers and challenges for PrEP use, um, and I think myself and Dr. Nassim, we've been using or uh, giving PrEP for a long, long time now. Um, you know, we always talk about barriers from the client standpoint. So we're talking about, uh, you know, non-acceptance, et cetera. But, you know, we also have to think about barriers from the provider's standpoint. You know, so there, there is also lack of acceptance by the providers um, that is, and we heard some of it, some undertones, and it will be interesting to see in the, in the discussion. Um, uh, that, you know, is PrEP safe or not? Will it increase risky behavior or not? Um, uh, patients, uh, clients coming in for PrEP um, often disappear after PrEP. Uh, and how, you know, we, we really ingrained adherence uh, from HIV standpoint, but how PrEP is different and it really is lifestyle based. Um, and, and as lifestyle changes, um, our PrEP requirements um, uh, also change. Uh, and that also then brings in the societal, which I think in Malaysia we got a really good feel of it, uh, of how um, they got in um, the society and also, um, you know, I really I like the idea of the, the Islamic Congress, never had really uh, thought of it that way, which is a great um, idea and I was speaking to Dr. Umar that that's something maybe we should uh, think about. Um, but when we talk about challenges, uh, I think demand generation is something that we still are struggling with with the MSM. The MSM population is very large, very heterogeneous, um, uh, and not all of them come to CBOs, and this is Again, something I've, I've also seen where, you know, prep, uh, clients coming to me, um, also MSMs don't go to CBOs, and often they're very surprised that we have PrEP available in Pakistan, um, so which, we, 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 which uh, really speaks to the fact that whatever uh, a PrEP rollout we do, it has to be multimodal. It has to really uh, be contextual on where we are, because another good example is how PrEP rollout in, in Malaysia can't be done the same way it's done in Pakistan because it's just different societies and different way that HIV is, uh, care is, is delivered. So, so those are some of the, the, the few things. I'm going to stay well within my four minutes, hopefully. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you very much. We have saved time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th thank you very much. Um, uh, I have been assigned with the topic of demystifying or debunking uh, PrEP. So basically, um, I think uh, the uh, barriers and challenges associated with PrEP are almost the same which we uh, have been discussing already. But uh, I would just be highlighting uh, uh, that uh, we know that whenever a patient comes to us, uh, there are so many questions about the use of PrEP. Sometimes uh, the clients, they come to us on their own will, and sometimes uh, they are brought to us uh, by some NGO uh, for, uh, you know, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So um, we have to tell them that uh, uh, there is very low pill burden and uh, the PrEP is very flexible and it has to be used on their demand and it also depends upon that what is what is their need um, as far as, as uh, Dr. Faisal has already mentioned that uh, currently we are providing PrEP to uh, those patients who are MSM and those who are transgenders and then zero discordant couples. In PIMS Hospital, uh, we have provided PrEP to 214 uh, clients and among them, uh, 114 were MSM and 37 were transgenders and 63 were zero discordant couples. And uh, by grace of Almighty Allah, uh, all of them are very much adherent to the treatment and uh, all of them, uh, uh, especially I would talk about zero discordant, none of the children uh, who are born are positive for HIV. And similarly, uh, the other patients are having regular follow-up with us, and they don't have uh, any, uh, you know, uh, HIV infection. So uh, the question uh, which uh, we usually uh, see that clients ask are, number one, whether PrEP is lifelong. Uh, so we tell them, no, that it is uh, very much according to your lifestyle and uh, your exposures, and uh, it can be, you know, modified as per your demands. The second question which is asked by the doctors that uh, most of my fellows and junior colleagues say, uh, ask that uh, it usually increases the sec uh, uh, risky behaviors. So uh, risky behavior uh, is, uh, I would say that um, uh, it's not very much and the studies have proved it as well. Uh, the only thing is uh, if the clients do not use condoms, there might be some uh, risk of uh, having sexually transmitted infections and adherence is the key to the success. And uh, another thing is uh, that uh, uh, 
clients are always told that it does not protect against other sexually transmitted diseases. So this question uh, has to be, you know, um, uh, told them in detail. And another question which is asked is about drug resistance. And we have to tell them that drug resistance only happens if you stop treatment. And if you have uh, already HIV positive status uh, or if the patient develops some acute retroviral syndrome which is unrecognized, undiagnosed. And another thing uh, is uh, those for hepatitis B viral infection patients, uh, uh, especially we have to be sure that uh, even driven PrEP is not offered to those who are having chronic Hep B viral infection because there are chances of uh, you know drug resistance, not for HIV, but uh, for hepatitis B. And so I would say that there are various questions from the client perspective and uh, uh, from the doctor perspective as well. And uh, other things which uh, have already been discussed are stigma and barriers, and most of the clients, they don't like to come to the areas uh, of especially HIV center because they are negative. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saiba. I don't have to put any effort in making you time bound. Ji, thank moon. you so very much. Um, like uh, my topic is uh, community prepared preparedness to how to take up uh, the PrEP within the uh, community-led uh, model interventions. Uh, before going further, I think we really need to highlight uh, like what kind of like challenges we are facing um, while creating the demand generation within the community and through community-based model. Like uh, one of the, um, uh, uh, there are many, uh, uh, I would say, challenges, but a uh, few of our major challenges are like uh, there is a, a misconception of daily uh, medication regime is still there and uh, there's a lack of awareness because uh, as we are dealing with the key population uh, which includes the transgender and uh, FSW mm -hmm. and also MSN. Most of the community is not highly educated, so uh, the literacy rate within the community is very low, and this is one of the like biggest reason there is a difficult to provide the awareness within the uh, very I would say uh, small spam period. So there is a need to take some follow-ups as well, and also um, yes, there is also uh, I would say uh, the fear of uh, uh, being stigmatized while taking the prep from the. Uh, like uh, government treatment centers. Uh, so these are the few challenges uh, which community is now addressing to us. So that is the reason like um, uh, we are uh, really keen to take some uh, initiatives and we are doing some practices to uh, uh, take up and to roll out uh, the demand generation of uh, PrEP within uh, or through our community-based interventions. So uh, our, uh, our one of the most, uh, like I would say, the top of the list preparedness is uh, we are doing the outreach uh, through our outreach workers. Like we did hire the our, uh, outreach people from the community, uh, the community people whom are like um, uh, from actually the highest population and they are like okay to penetrate within the community and what they are doing, they are creating the synergies through behavior change communication counseling and behavior modification and they are providing not only the specific behavior change services about the prevention system, they are also like creating the synergies with the uh, prep prevention services as well and and, and yes um, uh, as I said uh, there is a very limited awareness uh, within the community so, so what we do in collaboration with the UNDP our, uh, our, our, our PR partner so uh, we are mobilizing uh, the community by organizing the community mobilization events and through the community mobilization events what we do we uh, took on board our STA specialists which are the like qualified doctors but they are uh, doing their uh, uh, like conducting the uh, session specifically on the prep and they are trying to address the concern of the community in that mobilization events and uh, and yes um, uh, there is a safe space uh, which is uh, available in every uh, site offices in every community based uh, organization which is a drop-in center and in the drop-in center what we are doing we are um, organizing the sessions specifically um, uh, for the community who are willing to take the um, I would say uh, prep and uh, that session is uh, organized uh, by the STA specialist and STA specialist in that session is also providing the uh, I, I would say the awareness services uh, specifically to the community and, and addressing their concerns. Um, and uh, as I said, um, there is also a fear uh, of the community to being stigmatized uh, while taking the prep from the same treatment center. So what we uh, did, we do uh, that advocacy with the Provincial AIDS Control Program in collaboration with the um, uh, our partner, UNDP. And finally, after the multiple advocacy meeting, so we uh, have developed in collaboration with PSCP a, sp a specific clinic um, which is like, especially um, uh, uh, for the uh, prep, uh, I would say the clients. So what we do, uh, uh, the, those specific clients who are like not willing to take the prep from the treatment centers, so we do refer that uh, clients to that specific clinic so they are like uh, okay to get the prep from that, uh, I would say the special clinic. 
Uh, yes, um, and also uh, there is a um, uh, specific preparedness we uh, did focus on, and that is uh, the retention. And um, I would uh, also request the UNDP. Uh, there is a need to keep sustain some of the like uh, existing best practices which we need to take take up in the future uh, grant making cycle as well. And that is uh, our, our, our one of our good practices. STI specialists need to be taken on board uh, uh, as an HR rather than the service delivery providers. So uh, through that um, STI specialist is what we are doing we are uh, like uh, trying to uh, do the follow up and trying to do the reassessment of those people who are like uh, doing the prep so now they are okay yes someone is uh, like okay and someone is available to take care of our uh, like follow up uh, and to take care of our like physical assessment and our uh, like physical health condition as well and also uh, the last uh, but not the least um, <laughs> There is a need to uh, do the advocacy at the larger level, and uh, for that purpose, what we are doing, we are doing the stakeholder mapping, and through the stakeholder ma mapping, we are taking on board the stakeholders who are directly and indirectly, indirectly the influencing our prevention model, specifically the law enforcement agencies. So uh, we are uh, doing the advocacy uh, with uh, that. Uh, I would say the stakeholders to create a, some kind of like conducive spaces within the uh, available spaces and within the uh, uh, cities and district where the community uh, uh, led organizations are available. So through that we are able to reach out the unreached area and this is also like one of the good I would say uh, uh, practice to reach the unreached area to uh, create the more demand generation specifically for the prep. Thank you. Thank you very much Moon for bringing in such a, uh, such an, such a well articulated way the per perspective from the communities. Thank you. The Dr. Safdar Kamal Pasha from WHO. Uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> the problem is when you are uh, the last speaker, uh, you are hardly left with anything to uh, <laughs> add. So what I'll do is, uh, in fact, I will uh, summarize what has already been shared, the Malaysian model. Uh, Heather has uh, described about the Pakistan, what we have done so far in Pakistan. So uh, I will enumerate few strategies uh, that can help us to scale up uh, the, uh, the PrEP program in Pakistan. Unfortunately, what is happening on the ground is that the PrEP program is, whatever the, the program is at the moment, it, it is somehow uh, sort of a, a, a smoking or is functioning in isolation in, in a sense that there are numerous initiatives taken, uh, like we have PrEP, we have self-test, we have other initiatives. So uh, the first thing is that we need to adapt an integrated approach. Uh, all the, uh, th these initiatives, they can be uh, lim lung together so that the client, they get benefit, including the STI program. So the PrEP client, they have STI needs as well. So uh, adapting an uh, integrated approach, which could be or should be a differentiated one or decentralized from the facility uh, level to the community level. We heard that the program currently, whatever is uh, uh, operating at the moment is uh, facility based with linkages with the community. Somehow if this model uh, can, can be completely handed over to the, to the uh, community level, I think the access issue will, uh, uh, will be addressed a lot. Uh, then, uh, you know, Larkana has, the Larkana outbreak has uh, made us learn uh, uh, so many things. One is that HIV has become a health system issue. We cannot live without injection safety, blood safety, and other things. So adapting a health system approach for PrEP in the longer term uh, with this integration, maybe maybe a colleague from Malaysia, she mentioned about uh, integration into PHC, that, that, that's in the longer term, uh, could, be, uh, could be or should be considered for scale up of PrEP. Then uh, demand creation, uh, the stigma, the the uh, the client that those were facing at the moment, so demand creation, use of virtual models, uh, these are some of the strategies that can really help up, help to create not only demand but also uh, in the scale up uh, of uh, uh, if we adapt an integrated approach uh, that will help not only prep but also the self test and uh, the other initiatives. 
I think I stop here. Uh, not much more to share. So these are these were the, some of the strategies that just came to my mind. Thank you very Thank you much, Dr. Sir. Shukriya aapka. Now we move uh, on to the question and answer sessions. Uh, uh, due to the shortage of time, we will not be able to take many of the questions from many people. So uh, please uh, be focused and uh, be concise when you ask the questions. Agar, uh, uh, हमारे कम्युनिटी के जो मेंबरान यहां बैठे हैं वो उर्दू में सवाल पूछना चाहते हैं तो वो पैनलिस्ट हमारे मेरा ख्याल है उर्दू में भी जवाब दे सकते हैं सो और अगर आपको जो उन्होंने प्रेजेंट किया है जो कहा है उसके बारे में कोई बातचीत करना हो तो हम चाय के वक्फे के दौरान भी उनसे मिल सकते हैं सो प्लीज रेज योर हैंड्स फॉर क्वेश्चंस और प्लीज जो भी हुएवर वांट्स टू आस्क द क्वेश्चंस प्लीज इंट्रोड्यूस योरसेल्फ एंड योर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड देन आस्क द क्वेश्चन Uh, 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 for the ease of uh, understanding, we can also address to the person you are asking the question from, from any one of the panelists. So please uh, raise your hands if you have the questions. G. Usman, uh, I don't know which one can I say. Anyway, so I don't have a question. I have one thing to say. When there, there is a disorder in psychiatry, we call it hyposexual, uh, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And then there was an FDA-approved medication for it. And even in US, when they wanted to dispense it, they started telemedicine department. It was very much contested back then in 2018 or 2019. But even in US, people do not want to talk about their sexual lives with people. There is another model by E.M. Rogers, which is diffusion of innovation model, in which we, they say that there are innovators, there are laggards, and in between them, there are normal people. In PrEP in Pakistan, what we have missed is that we are not focusing people who are very uh, eager to take PrEP, and they are innovators, and they already have the knowledge. And these are the people who are not there in the venue-based uh, hotspots, but they are on the digital apps. So, and also I want to make a mention of the recent uh, recommendation change by the WHO, which is that you can start PrEP on HIV-ST, so that you do not have to go to the uh, clinic for even a blood-based test. You can take up the HIV cell test, you can consult someone online, and the, uh, there, there is a very limited role of the doctor. So these sort of virtual models for MSM, which is largely based on Grindr, Tinder, or Bumble, or whatever uh, dating apps, this is something that we need. And why are we missing it? Because we are trying to reinvent the wheel. Let's not reinvent it, and we are reinventing it for past many years. So that is what I want to say. So here comes our unannounced sixth panelist, Dr. Usman. <laughs> so, uh, any question, please? I, I do want to give a comment uh, on what Usman said. So, yeah. so this is something which, uh, which, which several of my clients have also asked uh, for, but there are other regulatory issues that come into it. So, for example, uh, you saw with the SIN, one thing that we're stuck with is dispensing the drug because they have to be dispensed by a physician in this country at this point. Um, and I've spoken to other of my MSM clients who are also physicians. Is they willing to take up this role of uh, within the community? And there is a little bit of a reluctance of that too. So, so I think uh, uh, using dating apps, using online demand generation is really important. And I think that is really a missed opportunity that we uh, that, that we have. And I agree with you. Um, you know, we, we're not capturing maybe the people who really want prep because they don't know prep is available. We're capturing people who who don't know about prep. Uh, uh, but there is one other thing which I think we really need to focus on is that prep is not the pill. It's a prep program which includes all of the other uh, things that go in it. So it's not just dispensing the, the pill. It's also a, 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 a way that I can link with people who won't be getting STI care, who won't be getting hep C care. Um, and I'm going to use my program as a panelist to ask a question for Dr. Anita, which I could not uh, because of time. That are you using doxypep uh, in Malaysia? Because that's something that I've started using also. Do, do, doxypep? Uh, no, not yet. OK. Uh, because that's the other uh, program that can be linked with this to reduce STIs uh, within the country. Junaid? Yes. I just want to add comment to uh, a very good comment indeed about uh, I mean our client don't have to go and see physicians I mean we should be made uh, we should make prep available this the same issues uh, have been debated a lot in Malaysia because I think the community uh, insisted that it should be the community led prep things like that but it depends on where you are but in Malaysia xenophobia uh, is a listed drug that must be prescribed by physician and must be 
dispensed by a pharmacist. And that's the issue. So therefore, prep lab, <coughs> a community lab prep is a no-no in Malaysia. So therefore, we have to use a different angle, how to make them come to you. So that's how we capitalize the, the situation. We can't uh, allow a community to prescribe because it's against in Malaysia, but, but how to bring them to the government centers? This is how, that's, that's what the Malaysian model. Same, same, same issue. Uh, it's Dr. just uh, maybe a few observations or comments. Um, PrEP's a very good program, it's a very good initiative, but uh, whenever we come to the use of medicine, that becomes a challenge or questions. Like uh, our uh, presenter from Malaysia rightly said, with the growing body of regulations in the country, who has the right to prescribe, who has the right to dispense PrEP, number one. Another key observation is that when we're actually going into PrEP, delivering PrEP, are we talking of event-based PrEP or are we talking about PrEP, a pill that somebody is going to take every day? That becomes another maybe something that we need to look into because knowing the threshold of how it goes, it's basically the 72-hour cycle that Dr. Fessel can further correct. So if we have uh, somebody who's taking PrEP, knowing the way, uh, I'll talk about the people in our country context, we're not really fond of taking medicines regularly. We can't even complete the seven day uh, prescribed dose of antibiotics that we need. So how do we ensure compliance to PrEP? Number one, the elegance of PrEP to complement the prevention package. Because PrEP alone does not uh, de-signify the importance of other prevention commodities or the use of other prevention activities. Regular testing. If you look at the program data of clients coming in for repeat service uptake for repeat HIV testing, and I'm talking about the negative clients, we see that a very few number of people actually re-come to our uh, prevention service delivery points for the re-uptake of prevention services. So how are we going to ensure that PrEP is regularly, repeatedly, continuously being uh, taken up? Furthermore, like we have some baselines, like what about people who are suffering from maybe kidney disorders? Regular RFT monitoring is there when people take PrEP. Sometimes LFT monitoring is there. So how are we going to look at uh, some of those issues? Moon very rightly highlighted the low literacy rates in the community level. So how do we co-balance PrEP, uh, comparatively more specialized intervention with community service uptake? So I'm not going to take a lot of the time, but I think when we talk of rollout of PrEP, we need to see a merger of the community, of the ART physicians, of the policy makers that we come together for a standardized policy. Secondly, maybe KPP LHIV can also act as peer navigators for PrEP, like they have their partners who might not be HIV positive. So they can actually encourage their partners to come in. We should keep the doors open, leaving it to the client, whether they want the service from the community or from the ART center. Because we also see that our service delivery points or CBOs are very nominal. Their presence is not there in every high burden district. Even within the district, they're not covering all the areas. How can we ensure that all the community people, they actually know about the CBOs? A lot of the patients that we come across, they don't know. They come directly to the ART centers. So we need to, uh, keeping in view the existing challenges of the on-ground situation, I think PrEP requires um, a lot of our core consultation so that we actually ensure its impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saba, and thank you very much, all the panelists. Uh, I hope there is no question uh, from the audience anymore. Is the hospital has one quick question? Heather wants to ask something? Yeah, just one quick question. I just wondered if any of the panelists could speak. I mean, I guess uh, on the issue, I, I feel like uh, What's not, what's not in question in Pakistan is adhering to what the drug regulatory authorities say around dispensing and around uh, testing for initiation onto PrEP. So I'm just curious about, in particularly colleagues working in SIN, the discussion about, it feels like, is the question really bringing people to the services or is the question about bringing the services to the people? And I guess what's the, 
vision around that. And then the second one is that when, when the data was given this morning by CMU, there was a considerable number of people who don't identify as key population who are living with HIV. And so has there been a discussion about zero discord in couples and the opportunity that PrEP might be for, for reaching zero, zero discordant um, couples? Thank you. So I, can, I can't see Heather, but I can answer part of the, 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 the question. So, uh, so th 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 there is a little bit of a, a data issue um, also in terms of uh, people identifying as MSMs versus being um, uh, not part of a, the, the key population. And we, we, uh, as you know, we just finished this uh, national survey also for drug resistance. And we also asked the same question that, you know, are you MSM, what, where you belong to? And several people felt that they do not belong to uh, the MSM population. Um, uh, because, uh, and they identify as sort of general population. So, so I think a, a little bit maybe a classification bias uh, over here. Uh, in terms of bringing people to the services and services to the people, I think uh, our goal is always to bring uh, the services to the people. Uh, that, 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 is, that is the holy grail, right? Um, uh, and I think that's where moving to CBOs, which I really want to applaud, um, uh, how looking at the, the, the way the service delivery has been, the challenges, and then coming with solutions and really so fast. Within, within a year or two um, coming with solutions and, and hopefully this is going to increase our, um, our, our yield, uh, our, our PrEP. No, and, and also uh, for, for, for uh, daily PrEP and, and, and uh, on demand, um, it's actually, uh, it's both. So, so and, and this is the issue uh, and, and this is where I think we may be lacking and I think we'll have to see how the CBOs manage but this is a conversation that we have to have whenever we're starting PrEP uh, because one shoe doesn't fit all and one shoe won't fit the same person throughout their whole journey um, also. So I've had clients who keep moving from one to the other depending on what they need um, and what the requirement is. Exactly, exactly. Somebody from the second row there, the lady in green. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dr. Seb, I forgot your name. The Kenneth. Uh, yeah, I just, I just wanted to respond like very quickly, uh, the span, uh, uh, he has talked about the telemedicine. So I just like um, wanted to like, um, announce kind of the initiative which has been taken by the uh, UNDP. So uh, in collaboration with the FHI, uh, FHI, we are like uh, going, it, it's, it, it, it has been already developed. Uh, there is a website that is a quicker and through that we are trying to reach out to the, uh, I would say the digital um, uh, uh, community, <laughs> the digital platforms <laughs> and uh, through that we will be able to reach out to the people who are not willing to come to the CBO centers. So through that we will be able to provide the, like I would say the tele services as well and, uh, um, and the Ma'am um, Saima has um, like asked about like uh, uh, we are talking about do, like what kind of like uh, clients like either the people who are taking the event driven prep or who are or, or whom are deal, uh, dealing with the like daily uh, 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 prep medication services. So um, uh, as for the targeted assigned by uh, the UNDP and the Global Fund, like uh, we are more focusing on the people who are at more high risk. So, so we are dealing with the sex workers mostly. So that is the reason we are like um, uh, providing the services and prioritizing uh, to, pri to providing the services to the, those people who are like uh, involved in the sex work. And last but not the least, um, when we talk about the literacy within the community, yes, there is a need to uh, focus on some digital literacy and uh, to uh, the, uh, like there are multiple like best practices which have been highlighted in like um, multiple like I would say the countries. Uh, so uh, I think we need to focus on digital literacy and through the digital li literacy we need to involve media at the larger level and because they there are some like I would say um, the infographic uh, digital marketing services available so that we will be able to I, I would say train or provide the uh, I would say um, specifically awareness to the people to whom we actually want to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nassim, if you would like to add something, then I'll yeah, I was just, uh, I wanted to add my uh, comment that uh, uh, services for HIV which are being provided in Pakistan, most of the people, they are still not aware of them. And PrEP is very, very a uh, new concept. So I think a lot of advocacy and uh, uh, guidance and awareness at all levels is very, very important. Uh, even the healthcare providers, they do not know that where PrEP is being offered and what PrEP is actually <laughs> for and who are the candidates uh, for PrEP. And similarly, at the client perspective, I would say that uh, there are a few uh, clients who are very much motivated, well aware, they want to get the services, but at the same time, they don't want to come to the uh, ART center. They just come privately or they ask on phone that they need PrEP, 
And the another question is that some of, uh, some of them, they really ask that dispense prep for a longer period of time because they don't want to come back. And some are going abroad and they don't want, don't want to disclose uh, that uh, they are engaged in uh, such kind of activities. So they want that prep should be dispensed for a longer period of time. So these are a few of the challenges which we face on a daily basis. And uh, um, as far as testing is concerned, because the program says that these patients should be regularly tested for HIV, especially for any breakthrough infections or any symptoms. So uh, linkages are very, very important. And close, uh, close monitoring of these are very important. So these are a few of the questions uh, which are open. And uh, uh, these are challenges at the same time uh, from the clinician as well as the patient's perspective. Uh, Dr. Muniba uh, from uh, Sindh Infectious Diseases Hospital, sir. My question is uh, to you, Dr. Faisal Mahmood. Um, so we've been seeing that a lot of clients for PrEP are coming in patients and like they come in clinic and they just want to have the pill bottle. You have rightly said that uh, PrEP is a whole program. It's not, not just a pill. But uh, the clients say just hand over the pill and we are going. They are in a rush. They don't want to engage in any sort of communication or conversation. So how to handle such situation? Because it's not just a pill, it's a whole program. And my uh, second question is that we have the Malaysian model uh, in front of us that uh, the ART or the clinic specific or health specific centers are there. Uh, and the compliance is quite good, the adherence is good. So can we also implement that here? How do you compare the two models in Pakistan and Malaysia? So I'll answer the second one, which is easier first. So, <laughs> so the, the the Malaysian model is is great, I think, and I think it, it speaks to the fact that they have, um, you know, integrated all of the care into one clinic, which is which makes it much easier to integrate one additional care into it. Unfortunately, our HIV program and many of the other programs are very still very vertical, um, so it's hard to sort of integrate now. Other Provinces are trying to do this. They, they've started to sort of make these more horizontal programs, and PrEP will become part of it. I mean, um, places where I think PrEP may be of use are STI clinics as opposed to HIV clinics, um, dermatology clinics where a lot of STI uh, people come. So those are really opportunities where we can maybe integrate PrEP into it. To answer your first question, that is a difficult one. I also get people who come and say, just give me the bottle. In fact, um, just this morning, I had already had two messages from my PrEP clients that, you know, I've run out and can I have my pill immediately? So, um, but the point is that it is still an opportunity to engage uh, with them. It's a still an opportunity to quickly do, you know, ask them, do you have any symptoms? Um, and, you know, for me, and uh, doxypep is really, uh, yeah, for me, an another game changer, which is another thing that I can um, start doing. So I've, I've started to use a lot of doxypep in my PrEP clients. Um, keep in mind that, you know, PrEP does not increase high-risk behavior. It's people who have high-risk behavior who take PrEP, right? It's the other way around that you think about, right? So, so um, and, and, and there are so many tools now available for, um, for, for prevention that's there. So, yes, I do give them the bottle, but I also make sure that they do come back. Um, I've had two seroconvergence also. Um, so we also have to be very aware that seroconvergence happen, and these are in people who um, had come and never really took the PrEP, um, luckily. So, well, no, unluckily they didn't take it. Luckily they went on PrEP and they're seroconverted. So, um, so, so we also have to keep that in mind. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Uh, my apologies to the people who really want to ask questions, and we cannot take more questions due to the shortage of time. We have taken 10 minutes more than the time already. We can catch up with the, uh, with the panelists during the tea time, uh, perhaps. They are available. They are agreeing. So I would request Dr. Adiba and Dr. Saima Paracha to please conclude the session. OK. Um, I think we've, uh, so far, it's been a very interesting morning. A very thought-provoking morning. We've been discussing a lot of issues from all the perspectives. I think one of the distinctness of HIV is that we get to have people from different backgrounds, whether it's the communities, the policymakers, the clinicians, the programmers, and even people who are working with us from partners. We get to uh, enjoy the different thoughts and the processes that come in. Um, regarding PrEP, this has been a very interesting issue. It's cropped up and it's uh, uh, actually brought uh, on face some of the various uh, successes. The models that we are going to roll out, the Malaysian uh, presenter has shared some very good insights in her slides that we can see how we take forward. 
So I think we would be working to see a full blown rollout of PrEP in the country and see how it impacts infection transmission. So thank you. Thank you.